Last week we covered the topic of the four marks of the church. Uh, the church that Jesus founded meets these four criteria based off of logic and what Jesus himself said. Uh, first, the church is one. Second, the church is holy. Third, the church is universal, or in Greek, Catholic. And fourth, the church is apostolic. And I explained last week how the Catholic Church bears all four of these characteristics. And this week I'm going to go through three different arguments, there's probably many more, but three different arguments that people pose against the idea that the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus founded. Objections, if you will, to the idea that the Catholic Church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. So, like last week, I said that the most important of the four marks of the church is the fourth one, apostolic, apostolicity, which is a word. Uh, if the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus himself founded, then it must be able to trace itself all the way back to the time of Jesus and his apostles. That's what apostolic means. And so, one of the more common arguments made against the Catholic Church goes like this. Well, the Catholic hierarchy and papacy only came into existence many years after Christ. Usually the explanation that is given is that the hierarchy of the church was invented sometime in the Middle Ages, uh, this little history refresher, uh, the Middle Ages, sometimes called medieval times or the Dark Ages, lasted for about a thousand years from the fall of the Roman Empire in the year 476 to the Renaissance in the 1450s. So in other words, this argument against the church claims that the hierarchy of the church didn't exist at all uh, until at least 400 years after, after Jesus ascended into heaven. Now, this one would be pretty easy to prove right or wrong, right? I mean, all you'd have to do is to look at the Bible or look at history to see if there's any sign of a church hierarchy before the year 476. First, let's look at what the Bible has to say. So in the Acts of the Apostles, one of the first things that Peter does after the Pentecost is he leads the apostles in electing Matthias to take the place of Judas, who uh, was no longer an apostle. After betraying Jesus, he, he hung himself. When Jesus chose his 12 apostles, he picked that number for a reason. 12 mean, uh, represents the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus is very uh, obviously and symbolically uh, founding a new Israel, which is the church uh, based off of the 12 apostles. So Peter gets up in front of the other apostles and he says that they should choose a man to replace Judas. And here are his exact words. He says, his office let another take. Now, when he says the word office, this doesn't mean that Judas had an office in, you know, an office building sitting behind a mahogany desk smoking a cigar and making business deals or something like that. Uh, what it means is it comes from the Latin officium, which means uh, duty or responsibility. Uh, and so here's where it gets a little bit nerdy. If, in Greek, the word for office is episcope, which is where we get the word episcopacy. And that word is one that we can use interchangeably in English with the word bishop. Um, so Peter, what he's essentially saying is he says, let someone take Judas's position as bishop. So um, <clears throat> a bishop by his office is a successor to the apostles. And this is very important because it's an obvious sign <clears throat> that the apostolic mission uh, that Jesus put upon his apostles is meant to be continued even after the original 12 apostles died. This is one of the first things the apostles do after Pentecost and after Jesus ascended into heaven. It was not an invention some 400 years later uh, in the Middle Ages. And as the church grew, there was need for more than 12 apostles, 12 bishops. So St. Paul, he was very detailed in his letters and his writings how he goes from place to place on his missionary journeys, ordaining new bishops, new priests, and he spends a lot of time talking about the church hierarchy in his letters. He gives, for example, very clear instructions on the qualifications that must be met in order to become a bishop or a deacon. Um, we see the hierarchy in action in, at another event in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, referred to as the Council of Jerusalem. Now, there was a disagreement among the first Christians as to whether or not you had to become a Jew first in order to become a Christian, which sounds strange to us, but you got to keep in mind that all of the first Christians were, in fact, Jewish. Um, uh, they practiced that, that religion, and uh, so they spent their entire lives following all of the Jewish dietary laws and cleanliness laws and things like that. Um, 
So would a Gentile wanting to join Christianity, would they have to be uh, follow the, the Jewish dietary laws and cleanliness laws as well? And this dispute was answered at the Council of Jerusalem, where James, who was the bishop of Jerusalem, he presided over the council, and they determined to come to an answer. And the, the council concluded that, no, you did not have to follow the Jewish laws uh, in order to become a Christian. And then they all basically turn toward Peter and say, mm. thumbs up or thumbs down, Peter. And, of course, Peter uh, Peter uh, agrees with the findings. And so this is how the hierarchy still works to this day. Since the Council of Jerusalem, uh, there have been 21 other church councils throughout the history of the church where the bishops of the world meet with the Pope to resolve one or multiple issues. And, of course, the most recent of these was the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. There are, of course, many other scriptural references and examples of the church hierarchy uh, existing from the beginning. Uh, but let's look at a couple of historical examples. Uh, first, there is a list of popes dating back all the way to St. Peter himself. And we know that Peter died in Rome. We know exactly where his bones are. You can see them to this day. Uh, we know that like Judas, someone else took Peter's place. Uh, it was in fact St. Linus, the second pope. We also have the writings of the earliest saints, and they all seem to describe a church that is in fact hierarchical. Uh, we're talking the very earliest saints. Uh, if they're describing a hierarchy, then how could that have been anything other than what Jesus intended? Either it was his intention to have bishops and priests and deacons and the laity, or he did a terrible job of preparing his apostles uh, for the church. And I don't know about you, but I'm not about to accuse Jesus of doing a terrible job of anything. Um, so here's an example of one of those early Christian saints, St. Saint Ignatius of Antioch. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, St. Ignatius was a personal disciple of St. John the Apostle, one of the 12 men who knew Jesus. In fact, John knew him the, the best, the closest. Um, he, St. Ignatius died in Rome in the year 107 by being fed to wild beasts in the arena. Uh, and we have a lot of his writings. Now, keep in mind that he died in the year 107. This is only 17 years after the death of the last apostle, St. John. Uh, so if there's any saint who could show us what an accurate picture of the very early church would look like, then it would be him. So let's look to his writings and see how he describes the church. Here's one of his writings. He's famous for writing seven letters uh, as he was arrested and being taken to Rome. He says, take care to do all things in harmony with God, with the bishop presiding in the place of God, and with the priests in the place of the council of the apostles, and with the deacons, who are most dear to me, instructed with the business of Jesus Christ, who is with the Father from the beginning and is at last made manifest. In like manner, let everyone respect the deacons as they would respect Jesus Christ, and just as they respect the bishop as a type of the Father, and the priests as the council of God and college of the apostles. Without these, it cannot be called a church. In other words, anyone who acts without the bishop and the priests and the deacons does not have a clear conscience. That's very detailed, right? We sometimes have this image of the church that is quite primitive and basic, and uh, already within the lifetime of the last apostle, we, we have a saint who is talking in detail about the hierarchy of the church because the Catholic Church wasn't conceived later on in the Middle Ages. Uh, there is no point in history where we can see any version of Christianity being corrupted and then turned into the Catholic Church, and that's because it was Catholic from the beginning. Uh, to call the Catholic Church a corruption of Christianity would be like calling Christianity a complete and immediate failure upon the ascension of Jesus. So that's the first argument against the Catholic Church being the one that Jesus founded. The second argument against the four marks of the church goes something like this. The Catholic Church may have a list of popes dating back to Jesus, but many of them were weak and sinful men. This one's a pretty shallow argument. It's what we call in logic class an ad hominem argument, which doesn't hold water. The simple truth is that neither Jesus or the church ever claimed that the popes would be free from sin. Um, if he wanted his church to be perfect, he would have sent angels as his apostles, not a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors. Uh, Jesus never said that the church would be free from sin, and that's because nobody is free from sin apart from him and his mother. Um, but what he did promise is that the church herself would be holy and free from doctrinal error. Uh, he promised that the church would prevail against the gates of the netherworld. 
So yes, there have been, quote unquote, bad popes. Um, popes that <coughs> abuse their power for their own personal gain and for their own personal desires. But amazingly, by the literal grace of God, not a single one of the weak or sinful popes ever taught any false doctrines or even attempted to change church teaching or the teaching of the gospel. You know, there could be satanic rituals going on in the highest levels of the church, and I wouldn't put it past the devil, but the church would still prevail through that. Um, and yes, there have been sinful men who have served in leadership roles of the church. We're all familiar with that. Um, but when it comes to the popes, uh, the vast majority of them have been courageous and holy men. 81 of the 265 popes have been canonized saints, and 29 of the first 75 popes died as martyrs for their faith. Those are pretty high ratios. Um, when considering there's only about 10,000 saints in the history of the church. And even during the time of the quote-unquote bad popes, there were still great saints in the church that held those popes accountable. Saints like Ignatius of Loyola and Philip Neri, and one of my favorites, Catherine of Siena, who literally told the pope to his face that he was being a child. Um, uh, and personally speaking, I trust that God will guide the church as he promised he would, even when our leadership is less than perfect. The third argument, the last one I'm going to talk about, is uh, it, against the four marks of the church. You may hear something from time to time like this, that the Catholic Church teaches many things that have no scriptural foundation. They're all made up. And the Protestant Reformation sort of restored the church back to its original state as intended by Jesus. The, the easy counter argument to this is that, well, not everything that Jesus said was written in the Bible. Um, John Chapter 21, verse 25 famously says this. It says, there are also many other things that Jesus did, but if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world could contain the books that would be written. So, uh, and Jesus never once uh, in uh, any of his speech said anything about a book, such as the Bible, that would contain all the answers. Um, he came on earth to form a church, not to form a publishing company. Uh, it, it would have been pointless in a time of very low literacy rates to do so anyways. Uh, and so his teaching was spread by word of mouth initially and not necessarily by the words of scripture. The Bible was only finally put together in the 400s or the 300s. And so his teaching was spread by word of mouth. And uh, I talked about all that months ago in my talks on divine revelation. You can go look at those for reference. And to the argument that we Catholics just sort of make things up uh, that are outside of the scripture, well, what about all the things that are directly in scripture that other Christians basically ignore? Um, you know, what about uh, the words, this is my body, and he who eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life? What about the words, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church? What about Jesus' teaching on divorce and remarriage? You know, the, the Hail Mary is almost entirely taken from the words of Luke's gospel. And then there is the other uncomfortable truth that many non-Catholic denominations do the exact thing that they accuse Catholics of doing. They adopt non-scriptural teachings for themselves. Um, Martin Luther, uh, his teachings of sola scriptura and sola fide, they're not in the Bible, ironically. Uh, neither does his idea of personal interpretation uh, appear uh, in scripture. In fact, the Bible says the exact opposite, Second Peter Chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, <clears throat> Peter says this. Know this, first of all, there, there is no prophecy of Scripture that is a matter of personal interpretation. For no prophecy ever came through human will, but rather human beings moved by the Holy Spirit spoke under the influence of God. So that shuts the idea of personal interpretation of Scripture down. Well, what about you know, some of the more absurd ideas posed by you know, modern Christians? The idea of the quote-unquote gospel of wealth. Um, which states that your financial status is an indicator of your faith because, you know, it's God's way of telling you that you, you can give more to charity now. This, these are ideas posed by, you know, your Andrew Carnegie's and Joel Osteen's and Dave Ramsey types. I'm here to tell you two things about the gospel of wealth. One, do, God doesn't care about how much money you have. There's no money in heaven. And two, the pursuit of money, for whatever reason you can justify, without exception, leads you away from God. Um, so these are all examples of why we need capital T tradition to set these things straight. The scriptures were a teaching tool of the early church, but they were not meant to be, nor did they even claim to be, the sole deposit of our faith. 
of doctrine. Any written document must be interpreted. Otherwise, different people will arrive at different conclusions and, well, we get what we get. So we need an organized, unified teaching authority to help us correctly interpret it, and that is what we call the Catholic Church. So that's that on this topic. Next week, we will finish the topic of the church with a brief explanation of the structure of the church.